Good afternoon, I'm Dennis Ward and welcome to today's live episode. Today we're putting the topic of pipelines in focus and more specifically, Kinder Morgan's proposed Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion. And it's a big day for the project. A Kinder Morgan shareholders meeting is being held in Texas. Shows of opposition are taking place in Texas and Burnaby at the same time. We want you to join in on our conversation. Our phone lines are open. Call us toll free at 1-877-647-2786. You can also tweet us at APTN in focus. Use the hashtag pipelines. We have our guests ready to go. In studio we have Clayton Thomas Mueller joining us. He is a member of 350.org. Joining us via Skype is Land Defender Canahoos Manual. Also via Skype, or hopefully soon anyways, Chiam First Nation Chief Ernie Cray. And on the phone we have Stephen Buffalo, the President and CEO of Indian Resource Council, an advocacy organization that represents the interests of over 130 First Nations in Canada that have oil and gas rights on their reserves and traditional lands. Welcome to you all. Before we get going, we're going to uh, set the scene here with a story from Tina House. In January, the BC government announced it would use every tool in their toolbox to hinder the Kinder Morgan's Trans Mountain expansion project. Now that fight is being taken to the province's Court of Appeal. Our approach to this reference is to ask the BC Court of Appeal to review proposed amendments to BC's Environmental Management Act. The amendments would give the province authority to place a permit with conditions before permitting hazardous substances into the province above a specified minimum level. Alberta Premier Rachel Notley says she's cautiously optimistic in light of BC's latest chess move. What we are suggesting is that we're not too worried. As long as they're prepared to abide by the rule of law, we're confident uh, in what the rule of law already is, which is that they don't have that jurisdiction. The Union of BC Indian Chiefs, along with the Wilderness Committee and Greenpeace, are also preparing to stand up against Kinder Morgan. They announced they received some insider information that the approval of the pipeline was rigged and are asking for a full investigation. It's a matter of record now that Kinder Morgan was lobbying the federal government heavily to approve the pipeline. Uh, what's wrong with this whole story is it now looks like the federal government had made up its mind, had, had directed its bureaucrats to start preparing for the pipeline before and during consultations with First Nations and with the general public. In plain language, that meant the fix was in. Kenahus, uh, let's start with you as you're currently closest to the project right now. What is it about this project that you're so concerned about? Well, the political climate here in, in so-called British Columbia is rare in that we have unseen and surrendered title territory. How is that sounding? Yeah, we've got you. Okay. Um, 180,000 kilometers of our territory is unceded, unsurrendered. There is no treaties signed in our territory, and that's the concern right now. Um, it's very different than even Buffalo's uh, territory, we never signed treaties here, and we stand as the women as the rightful title holders to the territory. And it's really important to know that internationally, within our nation, Indigenous nations, the matriarchs that hold the title for our territory, they're the title holders, the decision makers, and look after it with responsibility for the remaining um, people within our territory. We are the life of our nation, and one of the we're facing right now is the threat of Kinder Morgan Man Camp. Um, we toured up to Edmonton. We saw uh, three proposed sites of this man camp on um, Blue River, Belmont, and Clearwater, where they want to bring in a thousand men, male workers, industry workers for the Kinder Morgan pipeline. There's a direct correlation between these pipeline and these industry man camps in the increase in violence against women. And that's some of our biggest concern right now is the safety of and security of our women and girls in our own communities because of this pipeline infrastructure being built and bringing all these men into our nation. 
and a number of studies out there, uh, sp specifically in the North Dakota Bakken oil fields, uh, on some of those correlations that you're speaking of. Uh, Clayton, here in studio, you've been out there taking part in some of these uh, actions. What is it that uh, concerns you about uh, the pipeline expansion? Well, first of all, you know, industry and proponents of the Trans Mountain Pipeline continue to refer to this as just a simple expansion when it's actually an entirely new pipeline project itself. There are vast tracts of the proposed right of way that are new. They're going to have to pull up a lot of the old aging pipeline and replace it with new pipeline in other parts, and there's a twinning because they're going to build another pipeline for the condensate that they need to transport to the tar sands in Alberta to mix it with the bitumen so that it actually flows through the pipeline after they've superheated it. So, you know, first it's important to understand that this is not uh, uh, an expansion project or a modernization. It is a completely new pipeline that they're proposing to build. And, you know, I think, I think the biggest concern that I have uh, is related to uh, first and foremost, the bad faith that the Trudeau government uh, consulted with First Nations who are concerned about the impacts of a potential pipeline rupture or a tanker running aground in the Burrard Inlet, um, you know, tanker traffic which would increase sevenfold if the Trans Mountain uh, pipeline is built. Stephen, uh, what are your thoughts and the thoughts of the groups, the First Nations that you, that you uh, represent with the Kinder Morgan Trans Mountain Pipeline. Yes, thank you, Dennis. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, we want to definitely uh, acknowledge and honor the the, uh, the First Nations that are are standing up to this uh, infraction of uh, their their treaty rights and their Aboriginal rights as as their people in in their territories. You know, uh, obviously the the issues on the consultation and things things being pushed through. Uh, we definitely support that 100 percent. You know, uh, that's. They're not the only place in the country where that has, has happened. Uh, previous governments have, have definitely done that to all our, our nation members in Canada. So definitely we, we support the First Nations in that regard. However, you know, our, uh, in, in Western Canada, Alberta, Saskatchewan primarily, you know, we, we sit in a very uh, natural resource sector of the oil and gas. And, and um, some of our community members have participated uh, in, in the, that type of uh, development and it's benefited their communities very well, provided employment, uh, supplemented the lack of funding we get from the uh, federal government, and, uh, you know, we, we've been able to build houses, improve uh, our own economies, and uh, things like that. So, you know, the economics behind it obviously is, is important to some of our communities that, that do rely on it, and if, if there's a uh, a, a transportation mechanism such as a pipeline to to get to better pricing for our, our product you know it definitely helps our communities but you know going forward obviously you know with the discussions that have been happening uh, obviously you know previous government had made significant changes to the environmental policy which has been brought forward to today you know so the, the, pre the current government is dealing with environmental issues and the duty to consult when that was last year, last government's really implication of implementing that, and um, you know that's where we got to really step forward, you know, and, and rectify those because this is going to set a precedent going forward. I think, and it's it's important that you know First Nations are now at the table, that it, we are part of the discussion. If there's any projects going forward in the future, that you know they reach out to to our communities and, and provide that uh, opportunity to participate in the discussion through and through. So that we can, you know, provide that valuation of our our treaty and Aboriginal rights. So, you know, in support of yes, our, our organization has, has issued a uh, a uh, uh, letter of support in regards to the TMX. However, it, it's very conditional, you know, with the uh, su sufficient meaningful participation in Section 35 of constitutional uh, rights that our impacts and these uh, rights are identified and sufficiently accommodated. And that our land and resources necessary for continued exercise of our Section 30 rights are also protected. And that our First Nations are, are have meaningful economic participation in these things. So, you know, they just can't just come and give the beads and blankets up front, as my Uncle Joe Dion says. But, you know, we need more than that if, if things like this go forward. So that's, that's kind of where we are. We were, uh, hopefully we're still trying to get to Chief Ernie Cray from GM on the, on the line. He's a backer of the pipeline. In his absence, Stephen, you know, these deals are often uh, 
we don't know what's in these deals. Are you able to uh, give us some kind of an indication on what communities are seeing in terms of benefits for getting involved with this project or ones like it? Unfortunately, no. You know, due to non-disclosure with Kinder and the communities, um, we haven't been privy to any information. You know, but saying that, I'm, I'm pretty sure if it's if it's not enough, <laughs> then obviously, you know, that's that's why you know the, some maybe some of the communities are 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 saying no to the pipeline. I I don't know. And then again, you know, the the discussion on some of the environmental concerns. I agree, 100 percent. You know, but the only time I'll ever support industry, the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers and the Canadian Energy Pipeline Association, our regulations here in Canada are world class. And yeah, you know, the, things might happen, but you know, statistically, you know, um, I've done my research and I'm not an engineer, I'm not a scientist, but you know, uh, it, it, statistically it's safer to transport this stuff through the pipeline as opposed to having it on the highway or on the railway where, you know, the railways go past lakes and rivers and along highways. So uh, we, we never hear enough about the, the, uh, the rail derailments of the railroad, of, uh, of trains, uh, as to what the actual figure is. And, you know, it'd be pretty scary to see what happens in Quebec happen out west here. Sorry, I saw uh, Chief Ernie Cray popped up there. It, is uh, the chief joining us on the line? Okay, nope, not yet. Uh, I saw that, uh, Clayton, you were wanting to uh, add something there. Yeah. <clears throat> First of all, uh, you know, I'm glad that uh, Indian Resource Council is represented on today's panel. Um, you know, it's really interesting, Stephen Buffalo, you come from a community, Samson Cree Nation, I read from your profile on the website, you know, Samson Cree Nation, of course, is one of our First Nations in Alberta that is post-industrial. You know, they experienced the boom-bust instability of the oil and gas economy, and the community has suffered, as well as its sister communities in the territory, as a result of the collapse of the oil and gas economy that they had so much depending on. As, as a matter of fact, Peace Hills Trust, the bank, came out of the oil and gas money that their community uh, now runs to this day. But the, the lack of focus on just transition left many socioeconomic issues in that community that are persisting in other communities as well in the tar sands. You know, you look at Fort Mackay, you look at Fort Chippewan, um, you know, the biggest employers in these communities are the oil and gas sector. And we've seen the boom bust nature of these uh, these sectors, and you know, without a diversification emphasis uh, in our leadership's focus in First Nations, you know, expanding into the renewable energy economy, you know, the oil and gas sector is a sunset industry. The world is moving on. The city of New York has divested from big oil. Okay, there are countries going in that direction, other jurisdictions going in that direction, and the whole dichotomy of pipeline safety versus transportation by trains is just industry propaganda. Okay, I have yet to hear a politician or a train company or a pipeline company say that if Kinder Morgan Trans Mountain Pipeline is built that they're not going to transport oil by rail. The reality of it is is that the oil companies operating in Canada's tar sands want all the train capacity and all the pipelines that are on the table. Okay? And so this, this, this attempt to dupe the public into thinking that it's one or the other is just a load of industry propaganda. It's BS and they want all the train capacity and all the oil pipeline capacity. So, uh, Stephen, I respectfully challenge you on that fear-mongering that you're doing. Uh, yeah, it's, it's not fear-mongering. It's just, you know, information that I've, I've, I've done myself, you know, and, and researched myself. Uh, again, you know, uh, you can say what you want, but... It, well, you it, said it, you were not an engineer, so, yeah, you know, no, this is coming research, from so. engineers. Okay. That's the fact of the matter. All right. You know? Kenna, uh, we've heard a lot about these 30 or 40 First Nations or so that have signed on to or signed benefit agreements, but we've also heard from some of them that uh, say they had to sign these contracts out of the despair in their community. Is that something that uh, you've been hearing from people on the ground out there? Well, I think the, the, one of the first things to, to really put attention on is that, that nationally that Canada is really trying to push some extinguishment policies and laws right now on a national level and this fits right into the extinguishment process no matter which way if it's an MBA or some type of letter of, uh, of approval to Kinder Morgan whatever the chiefs are these INAC chiefs are signing whatever way you squeeze this pimple it's going to come out extinguishment 
And that's not what we're about. We're not about extinguishing our rights and our title to our territories. And that's what these agreements with Kinder Morgan do. It does extinguish our rights and our title to our lands um, and, and gives a little cash incentive and says, that, says there's jobs. But talking to the Chiam members, there is no jobs. They said that there was some signing for some security, but there have Chiam they're um, not even Chiam, the, the, chief, the, the chief that signed this agreement doing security, the same thing that Tiger Swan did at Dakota Access Pipeline. Now these pipeline companies are hiring our own Indigenous people to do Tiger Swan, I mean, Tiger Swan's job. It's, it's, not, it's not good no matter which way you look at it. It's a bad deal. We're going to lose. Native people are, are always at the, bat, the, the shitty end of the stick, as you say it, no matter which way you look at it, Kinder Morgan Pipeline is going to cause destruction to our homelands. And that's what we are standing to protect, is our homelands, our berry picking grounds, our medicine harvesting grounds, our hunting grounds, our fishing grounds. We are the title holders, the ones that use the land, utilize the land, and we have for thousands and thousands of thousands of years. As the woman, it's our responsibility to stand up against this pipeline. This pipeline is dirty bitumen being transported from the Edmonton tar sands where our relatives are telling us they're already receiving the impact health-wise over this bitumen and over this tar sands. So we don't want this. We want to bring it all the way down here through 518 kilometers of our Sukhumuk territory. And we're saying, no, the people don't want to see the women cry. The people don't want to see Indigenous women harmed. But that's what this will bring. Our women are crying at our berry patches. Our women are crying at our fishing rocks because of the impacts that industry has had on our life. It has to stop. Kinder Morgan Trans Mountain Pipeline must stop in order for us to have a life, a survival as Indigenous people to practice our own religion, our own spirituality, our customs and our traditions. We have our own. We even have our own way of making decisions through our community assemblies, our nation assemblies, where everybody is included. And that's where we have said no. In our Sukhwatmukuluk assembly, with hundreds and hundreds of our people said no to this pipeline. Thousands. Clayton, it was uh, about a month ago now that Kinder Morgan decided to halt all non-essential spending on this yeah. project. Did that, uh, as somebody, uh, as an opponent to this project, did you see that as a victory or or has it become a, a ploy, I guess, to, uh, to get the government to potentially throw in money here? Well, I think you hit the nail on the head. You know, to quote uh, Grand Chief Stuart Phillip of the Union of BC Indian Chiefs, you know, he said that <clears throat> the, the, the halting of non-essential spending by Kinder Morgan was the first step in an exit strategy by the company. Uh, you know, Justin Trudeau, no matter which way he plays it, uh, you know, his government has, you know, made a gamble with voters in B.C., with voters in Quebec, uh, who are also very anti-pipeline, um, thinking that he would be able to win voters back before the 2019 election. Uh, but the reality of it is, is that B.C. is just not having this pipeline. The government, the city of Vancouver, Nanaimo, and Burnaby, you know, hundreds of First Nations, uh, everyday citizens have built an unbreakable, unpenetrable wall against Kinder Morgan's Trans Mountain proposal. And Justin Trudeau is facing, A, you know, he bails out the company with taxpayers' dollars, which has been terrible, you know, for him in the media. And, you know, even conservatives are uh, adamantly opposed to that kind of corporate Although welfare. Although I have heard some conservatives actually say this is a project, uh, bizarrely enough, now they're, they're in favor of putting in government well, funding. Well, there's even natives that support the pipeline. Look at Chief Ernie, Ernie Cray that's going to be hopefully jumping on soon and commenting. But, you know, the fact of the matter is, is that the company also has an option to sue Canada through secret World Trade Organization tribunal um, over loss of profits. So no matter which way you slice it, uh, you know, this speaks to a much bigger problem of the design of our economy. You know, climate change, the tar sands, you know, all of these things are, are, are deriv derivative from, you know, our economic paradigm that forces us to sacrifice certain communities at the altar of irresponsible energy policy. And our prime minister, you know, going back to the doublespeak and the bad faith uh, consultations that he did has, you know, stepped out of, out, of, out of play here. And we've got him. 
And so whether or not you know, Canada bails out Kinder Morgan by the March 31st deadline or the lawsuits, the multiple lawsuits from First Nations you know, terminate the pipeline proposal in the way that it, they did with the, the Enbridge Gateway project, which was also approved by Prime Minister Harper. So approval really doesn't mean anything when it comes to the powerful indigenous legal regime that First Nations peoples have here in these countries they call Canada. Stephen, I do want to come to you in a second about uh, the potential for First Nations ownership in this pipeline. But first, we're going to go to a, a caller, and we have uh, John on the line from Thunder Bay. John? Hi. Your Am thoughts? On? You're on. Okay, thank you. Uh, I am opposed to this pipeline. This pipeline will not reduce a single uh, amount of money anyone pays at the gas pump. This is selling uh, oil in American prices, therefore the corporation gets rich, and selling it back to us refined as gasoline, and guess what? U.S. prices, so they get rich again. I think that if we were, we should be looking at building refineries in Canada and selling it to Canadians first, because the market is in Canada first, not in, not, I mean, this is just making Donald Trump rich, and nobody wants to see that. John, are you seeing uh, people use the, the high gas prices? BC seeing outrageous prices. Thunder Bay is always uh, 10, 15 cents higher than other places. Are you seeing that uh, used as a, a reason why this pipeline should happen? Well, the, the reason why that gas prices are high is because there, uh, there are very little refineries in Canada. We import, I, I forget the number, somewhere around 50% of our refined gasoline comes from the States. Well. Why are we selling them our oil, making their corporations rich, and paying U.S. prices for gasoline? This is ridiculous. John, we appreciate your calling in and watching the show. Thanks a lot. Thanks for coming back. Thank you. Bye. Stephen, I will go to you, but first we've got to throw to a quick break, and then we'll be back here to continue the conversation on Trans Mountain Pipeline here on In Focus. Welcome back to In Focus, and we're going to go to social media now to hear what some of you are saying about today's topic and my weekly attempt to get this touchscreen to work. We asked you this week, do the benefits outweigh the risks of the Trans Mountain Pipeline? Joshua Morin said these, quote, benefits do not include all Indigenous peoples, only the risks do, which seems to be a pattern from the government for over 150 years. There it works. And Mike says, to me, the economic arguments are moot. This is a land territory issue, a test of land rights and whether Canada and Canadians can walk the walk they've been talking. Next, we have Brian, and uh, I'll just do this. And Brian has, uh, says, the question should be, have all rights-holding Indigenous peoples given free, prior, and informed consent does anyone truly have the right to threaten the earth and future generations? And lastly, from Doreen, who says, hope you're also calculating the increase in production at the source as well. Oil sands will triple with this line. Land, water, air, wildlife already at great risk. And this will triple the negative impact. If you would like to add your opinion to our topic of conversation, here's how. Join our conversation now. Send your thoughts in an email to infocus at aptn.ca. Like our APTN In Focus Facebook page. Follow and tweet us at APTN In Focus or call in toll free at 1 877 647 2786. Almost had that board working. We are now being joined by the managing editor of the National Observer. Uh, he's been covering, Mike D'Souza has been covering politics for more than a decade, focusing in recent years on energy and environmental policies and government and industry. And uh, he most recently has been investigating the Trans Mountain Pipeline and uncovered some big details. He joined us earlier from Ottawa. Mike, really appreciate you uh, taking some time for us here today. Can you walk us through what your reporting has revealed when it comes to the federal approval of the proposed Trans Mountain Expansion Project? Yeah, a number of things, uh, Dennis. Um, 
you know, one of one of one of the first things is that soon after soon after the the Liberals formed a government in 2015, uh, they were of course heavily lobbied by by the oil and gas sector and in particular by by Kinder Morgan. There were meetings between, uh, or at least exchanges, and we know of at least one phone call between uh, the president of Kinder Morgan Canada and, and high-ranking public servants at uh, Natural Resources Canada. And soon after those meetings, the promise that the Liberals had made uh, to restart the, the review um, and, and to change the process for reviewing Kinder Morgan, this kind of got whittled down soon after the lobbying and that the the high-ranking public servants were warning the government that if they do restart or if they had restarted the process at that point that there was a danger that the company might walk away so there were concerns raised and fears about losing the project altogether which resulted in in the government ultimately deciding to scale down its promise instead of doing a full new review it added an additional layer of what it described as consultations by appointing an independent panel that would review the National Energy Board's work a bit later on. But then as the summer went on, and we're talking about the summer of of 2016, uh, there were warnings that the public servants were getting from First Nations that felt that the process the government was taking to consult them was not adequate, was not meaningful, was, was incomplete. And so there were concerns that the process was moving too fast, raised by First Nations and conveyed by the public servants who were working with them directly to to the highest levels of government. Uh, but despite those those warnings from the public servants and the concerns that were raised both both publicly and privately by the First Nations, um, the government seemed to want to go ahead at the pace that it was going uh, in order to to be on track to have a decision by the end of November. So what we found um, is that there was a meeting about four weeks before the project was approved in which a high-ranking public servant, an associate deputy minister, instructed public servants at that meeting that they had to find a legally sound way to get to yes. And this was at a time that the government was publicly saying it hadn't made a decision. And it was also at a time that the government, of course, was telling First Nations such as the tsleil Nation that they hadn't made a decision, they still had an open mind, and uh, that they were open to consulting with all First Nations and accommodating, uh, accommodating their needs. So, Mike, was the fix in on this pipeline project? Well, that's certainly what what the public servants that I've spoken to who were who were involved in this have have told me. You know, the government has said publicly that it kept an open mind and that it uh, wanted to hear the concerns of First Nations. Uh, but we also have heard public statements made by the Prime Minister in, in which he said that there was always a trade-off, that there was uh, an important component to getting this project approved as part of uh, securing Alberta's support for, for a national climate change plan. So the government had decided what direction it wanted to go into. I mean, I leave it up to, to the courts, I guess. Uh, you know, and as you know, Dennis, there is, there is a case before the courts, before the Federal Court of Appeal, and I, I presume that that court will decide whether or not a fix was actually in. You know, high-ranking uh, officials instructing public servants to find, quote, a legally sound way to approve the pipeline weeks before consultations with First Nations has ended. This is now the focus of another lawsuit. Is it not following your reporting on this? Well, through the existing case that's before the Federal Court of Appeal, the hearings on that case wrapped up last fall of, of uh, several First Nations led by the, the tsleil Nation. And what they did after our reporting uh, in what was a pretty exceptional uh, motion or, or, or move, uh, they asked the court to reopen the, the evidentiary record to accept new evidence and to consider that before issuing their ruling. So uh, a lot of us were expecting that decision would have come out maybe this month or maybe next month. But what is happening now is that there could be other delays now that this motion is before the Federal Court of Appeal. Uh, the government, uh, the motion was, was introduced May 2nd la uh, last week. Uh, and the government has 
10 days uh, or would have had 10 days to respond. Uh, so we'll see, like once that response comes in and then the court is seized with the motion and the court has to decide how it's going to handle it. Mike, what do you think this says about the way the federal government approves big projects like this? Well, clearly there there is evidence and, and, and there are concerns that have been raised by, by many people over the years about the entire review process of, of major projects. Uh, proponents, particularly when they're, when they're powerful industries, uh, they, do have, they do have a reach and they do have uh, access to, to, to the highest decision makers in, in, in Canada. And so in this particular case, um, you know, there, there is a lot of circumstantial evidence that this access, this privileged access that uh, a major company like, like Kinder Morgan had, uh, certainly they're, in terms of what they were asking for and what they were lobbying for, what the government decided is very close to uh, what, what would have been in the interest of the company. So, you know, there are concerns about whether this process was, uh, was proper or was fair. Um, but again, these are the allegations raised by the people who were involved in, in the talks. The government has certainly a position. The companies will certainly say that, you know, it's important for them to have an open dialogue with government. And, and, and you know, certainly, I mean, in terms of what the Constitution says, the government does have a legal duty to consult under Section 35 of the Constitution. It has this constitutional obligation, that's the law of the land, to consult with First Nations. And in this case, the evidence that I've seen in particular indicates that maybe this wasn't the case in terms of the review and approval of the Trans Mountain Expansion Project. Mike, we're going to have to leave it there, but the important work you've done on this, and uh, we appreciate you taking some time for us today. Thanks very much, Dennis. Clayton, when you hear that and whether the courts decide, I guess, whether the fix was in or not, uh, how does it make you uh, feel when, uh, you know, uh, American energy giants are the ones who seem to be, you know, giving the federal government, here's your deadline to, to give us this uh, and uh, kind of dictating what's going on here? Yeah, you know, I think it's, 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 it's such a sad day that a Houston-based energy giant, the child of uh, the former corporation Enron, uh, you know, when Enron failed, it gave birth to Kinder Morgan, and well, here we are. Uh, the fact that uh, this company has Canada and the Alberta government doing its dirty work, um, that, you know, it's probably still going to pursue, even with a bailout, a WTO lawsuit in a secret tribunal that citizens and Canadian democratic mechanisms have no influence on. Um, and then that, 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 that he, uh, you know, he being Justin Trudeau, is passing that dirty work down the line to, you know, you know Canadian Association of Petroleum Pro Producers, friend groups like the Indian uh, Council uh, on Energy or, or whatever, you know, what, what, see who Stephen Buffalo represents, uh, and to proponent uh, First Nation leaders, you know, that have been many who have signed uh, letters of accommodation with Kinder Morgan as a result of significant socioeconomic circumstances in their communities. You know, they're teetering on the edge of third party management. And, you know, it's these vulnerable circumstances that this Houston based corporation working in collusion with the Alberta government uh, and with uh, uh, the Canadian uh, Trudeau government uh, that they're exploiting. They're using economic blackmail tactics, they're using neo colonial tactics to exploit a circumstance to try and push through a pipeline that's going to hardwire First Nations and Canadian economies into a sunset industry past our 2030 commitments to go to 100% renewables. You know, Justin Trudeau signed the Paris Climate Accord and he came home months later and approved the Line 3 pipeline here in Manitoba and the Kinder Morgan pipeline in BC. This double speak against the backdrop of promising to ratify the UN Declaration of Indigenous Peoples. Here we are four, almost four years into the administration Still a water crisis on First Nations, still a crisis with murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls, uh, which Kanahus has been talking about with the man camps. Uh, there's just a lot of disappointment. And, you know, on the eve of the 2019 election, I would be very concerned if I were involved in Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's campaign. Stephen, uh, you mentioned the, you know, the protection of Section 35, and do you think that that was uh, 
fully uh, implemented here when you're talking about consultation, but uh, some of this reporting makes it look like the, the decision was already made before that consultation even uh, really wrapped up. Absolutely. You know, it, we've been saying that all along. You know, uh, all of these uh, projects that have been put forth by the government, <clears throat> doesn't matter which one, uh, First Nations has always been on the outside looking in. And, and when it comes to, well, this is what we're going to do, here, and here's your compensation, you know, it's not adequately uh, enough to, to, to consider. And then given the, sca the, scape, the scope and the scale of uh, where Kingdom Morgan's at, you know, uh, the valuation of the Aboriginal rights and treaty rights, you know, has to be taken into account. You know, the, you know the, even though the government has, has brought forth, you know, the United Nations Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples, we're still not at that point where we have that hammer to, uh, to really put things forward. So, you know, yeah, we're in courts. The Supreme Court have, has ruled in our favor in, in a couple instances. And, you know, it's, it's, it's set a precedent now. So, you know, the, the, the issue on the consultation, it, it definitely has to be thoroughly investigated properly. You know, industry has their, their, uh, their, their notion on what consultation means. Same with both provincial and federal governments, what they think consultation means. And, of course, our First Nations, who have last to say, has its own version of what the consultation piece means. So, you know, there's a lot of work going forward. But at the same sense, you know, like Clayton said, you know, there's a lot of socioeconomic problems in our communities. Water is still an issue. Health care is an issue. Uh, all the things that he said, you know, and, and, and where, where are we supposed to get the funds to, to kind of combat those things? So, you know, in our communities that produce oil and gas, that would, that's what we do. We, we, we subsidize that lack of funding to try to tackle those problems. Education, maybe put up a youth center, maybe put up a hockey rink for the youth, you know, and it, it's just... You know, given the circumstances and way things are kind of transpiring, everything that's going to happen out of this, this pipeline, it, uh, it's going to set a lot of precedent. And again, we, we definitely support those nations that have been violated with their Aboriginal rights and their treaty rights. You know, it, it has to be rectified now because as they move forward, you know, there's, there's probably about $500 billion worth of invested plans over the next 10 years that the government wants to implement. So their approach to how they deal with, with First Nations has to change. And in, in this, this instance with the kinder, it's going to set that precedent so that our, value, our valuation of Indigenous rights and Aboriginal rights, treaty rights, are at the forefront and that we're, we're protected. You know, of course, we all want to protect the environment. Absolutely. You know, but at the same sense, you know, we, we, we have to find a way. To, to, to be, at least be at the table and to, and to uh, try to combat those social issues that are, are plaguing us now. Stephen, in talking about getting at the table, I had wanted to ask you this. You know, the federal government and the province of Alberta are looking at potentially putting money towards this pipeline. There's been some talk that maybe some First Nations out there would like to get involved. Is that uh, something you'd be advocating for, taking an ownership in this pipeline? Absolutely. You know, the, again, you know, the economic benefits to... Uh, Again, combat our social problems is one thing. But on the other side of it, you know, there's probably possible careers, jobs. You know, if, if I know our people are, are doing the best they can to, 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 to be part of this, you know, I think it's a great benefit to our, our people. Um, you know, uh, it, it's, it's, it's something that has been talked about, you know, a straight-up business model. Uh, you, you look at uh, Suncor, Fort McKay, and Mikasu that had, had struck a deal. No political government involvement. Uh, it's there. It's done. You know that's one model that can work. And, and I'm sure if we investigate for, furthermore, I'm sure we can find other models that can work for all First Nations. You know, a, a big dream is you know maybe we, we create something that the all 634 First Nations in Canada see benefit from this. You know, and that would be great. But again, you know, we we have to take care of what's in front of us right now. And that's the uh, impact that it's having on, on, on our lands and our, our environment and our, our rights as people. So, you know, that's, that's the big, big thing right in front of us. So once we can get past some of those issues, then, you know, then we have to be at the table. You know, again, I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at strictly at this as a, an economic opportunity, a, uh, an opportunity for our people to, 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 to get out of this, these, these problems that we do have as First Nations in Canada, you know, uh, it's sad to hear some of the stories from coast to coast as our, as our our communities continue to suffer with with social problems, and uh, we we have to find a way out. 
and and uh, we we uh, we're not supposed to talk about revenue sharing. That's one thing that the government has tried to uh, train our people <laughs> to say. But the the NRTA, you know, maybe that gets thrown out. You know, maybe we look at revenue sharing right across this country. Um, you know, there's some communities that have done well economic benefit wise. You know, uh, not all communities can have internet gaming. Not all communities can do tobacco sales. Not all communities have casinos. You know, so we have to find a way with the resources that we do have to share them and to see our, benef- our people benefit from it. You know, it, it's, it's just one way, but again, we have to do it consciously with, with the keeping our environmental concerns in mind. You know, and I'm often, often reminded that that's a, a, a priority. You know, so working with the, uh, the oil and gas industry and government, we, we are doing our best to make sure that those environmental concerns are definitely done right and justified for our people's safety. Ken Hoos, the mayor of Vancouver is on the record today saying that an escalation of resistance is looking likely. Is that uh, going to be the case, do you think, uh, opposition to this pipeline? And what would that look like? Yeah, conflict and confrontation is going to continue to increase. Um, We're going to continue to see direct action take place all along this pipeline route. I went with my family, traveled right up to the Edmonton terminal. We traveled right down the whole route. There's going to be actions taking place along this whole route during this um, threat of construction. Um, Kinder Morgan defies all of our Indigenous laws, and anyone that signs with Kinder Morgan is also in violation of our laws. We have many, many different solutions for the crisis that we face as Indigenous communities. And we are looking into different options such as hemp and such as the cannabis industry to be able to combat some of those symptoms that we have faced right now being displaced off of our territory. We believe in economic interests, but we believe in it not not violating our own Indigenous laws, our women laws, our children's laws. And so we'll continue to have economic certainty within our nation, but dealing with uh, business that are going to respect our ways, our ways of life, become the biggest nation in so-called British Columbia. And we're going to stand in all defense, defend our land and the women. We have the highest rate of violence against women. And we don't want to see that increase with the man camps, this resource extraction industry coming to our lands. Um, Kinder Morgan Pipeline, it will bring deadly consequences for Indigenous women and girls, and we do not want to face that risk. Ken Hoos, there are some out there, obviously uh, many of them uh, in favour of this pipeline, who feel that uh, elements of this opposition uh, to the project is, is militant or radical. Uh, what would be your message to those people? Well, I say yes, it is. It is, it is radical, because it is the radical change that we need in our communities, in our Indigenous communities, and around the world in order if we want to protect our land. We're going to have to make that radical change, and that's going to look at, I um, mean, looking at ourselves as individuals and as leaders in our communities um, to create that change. And we have to take that courage right now. We're standing against great odds, you know, right now in our nation. We're standing against great odds facing off against Canada and the Kinder Morgan Pipeline. But we're willing to take that risk. Um, because the threat is way too much for us right now. We are salmon people. We come from the salmon. BC is indigenous people are salmon people. We're salmon nations. We depend on that salmon. Chiam and the warriors there faced off in a salmon war in the 1990s and the early 2000s. I was there firsthand with the Native Youth Movement and the West Coast Warrior Society as our people in Chiam were standing on title and rights and self-determination as nations, as matriarchs, as women and the Douglas family there. Standing, they're standing, that's who I stand with. When they say no pipeline, that's who I stand with in Chiam. Ken uh, I'm going to have to, sorry, I'm going to have to hold you there. We've got to throw to another break. And uh, I do want to thank all of our guests, Stephen and Ken and, and, uh, and Clayton, for joining us today. Unfortunately, we didn't get the chief from GM in uh, maybe another time. After the break, we will be joined by APTN web reporter Lucy Scully to get the latest from the shareholder meeting that Kinder Morgan was holding today and discuss what residents of British Columbia and Alberta had to say about the pipeline going through their communities as she drove through the mall. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to APTN in Focus. APTN's Tamara Pimentel and web reporter Lucy Scoli drove along the 1150 kilometer route during the heat of the Trans Mountain Pipeline debate. Lucy will be joining us in just a second to talk about her time on the road. But first, here's a look at what they encountered along the way. The trip began at the end of the pipeline route at the Kinder Morgan Terminal in Burnaby, BC, where we saw the arrest of two protesters. We attended a salmon ceremony in Chiam First Nation, a community whose chief and council are for the pipeline. We heard concerns about the pipeline's environmental risks from Coldwater and the Shuswap Nation. The pipeline route then led us to Enoch Cree Nation in Alberta. It's one of 43 Indigenous communities to sign a mutual benefit agreement for the pipeline. There's a different mentality here in Enoch from the protesters further west. People don't really care besides the fact that they just want their hand in some money, you know, so that they get a little, uh, little bit of money for doing it, I guess, uh, land-wise. But other than that, I, don't, I never heard anybody talk about it, really. And it isn't uncommon to come across an oil field worker here either. For Stephen Rain, it's a way of life. That's what we do is uh, do pipeline and, and oil field work. So, I mean, to me, it's, it has to be done. I, I can't see uh, any other way for it to be. Uh, that was my bread and butter for 20 plus years. So, I mean, <laughs> I'm kind of biased that way. Roger Buck has had years of experience in the oil industry. He says he'd prefer to see an expansion along the existing route than the use of a train to transport oil. In my opinion, the, the pipeline has to go. I mean, it's essential not, least, not only for Alberta, for the rest of Canada. Emily Jackson, who lives near the reserve, disagrees. I don't want the, the forest and the animals and everything. I don't want none of that ruined. And you're also taking away jobs from transport drivers. They, I mean, they deliver fuel back and forth too. So, I mean, that's job losses there. The 1,150-kilometer journey ends at the gates of Kinder Morgan in Edmonton, where security trucks patrolled us near the Trans Mountain Expansion construction site. Ariel Duranger is the executive director of Indigenous Climate Action. She lives in Edmonton but is a member of the Athabasca Chippewan First Nation, another community throwing their name behind the expansion project. She says she feels betrayed, not by her leadership, but by the government. You tell communities that are living in abject poverty, or maybe not even abject poverty, but that are just making it to get by, that they have this opportunity to create these programs, to have health centers, to um, you know, be able to hire more staff, to do all of these things that they've been dreaming of doing for so long. But in order to have that, they have to compromise their values. And the only reason they're willing to do that compromising of values is because they're told that this project is going to get built with or without them. And joining us now from our Ottawa studio is Lucy. And uh, Lucy, let me just say for starters, that was some great work that you and Tamara did out there. Unfortunately, we're really short on time, so uh, I'll have to jump ahead here maybe a little. And if you can bring us up to date uh, on today's uh, Kinder Morgan shareholder meeting and, and what's been taking place. Sure. So two Indigenous chiefs traveled from B.C. to Texas for the meeting with a clear message that the pipeline will not be built and that it's not about whether B.C., Alberta or Ottawa wants the project. It's about whether uh, Indigenous people give full consent. Uh, the chiefs were also allowed to present a resolution calling on Kinder Morgan to issue annual sustainability reports that would outline the company's social, environmental and governance risks, including risks to Indigenous uh, or related to Indigenous rights. Rather, This resolution passed by a majority of the shareholders and this is something that came as a surprise to those at the meeting. They say this signals an unprecedented shift for those stockholders. We also heard that during the meeting, Kinder Morgan tried to reassure investors that whether or not the project gets built, it won't affect their dividends. And uh, I guess, uh, you know, yesterday we heard the energy minister saying that he's still adamant this pipeline expansion is going to happen. Uh, you know, what are Ottawa's options given what you're hearing today and what's happening there? 
Right. So the federal government has said it's exploring all legislative and financial means to get the pipeline built, including investing on the project, as you mentioned earlier in the show. Uh, however, there are, there are only three weeks left for the federal government to convince Kinder Morgan that the pipeline will be built. Um, also complicating matters is that Kinder Morgan is also facing legal challenges on the pipeline. Uh, but if this project passes every legal and legislative hurdle, then Ottawa will have to figure out how to build the pipeline through those who are on the ground fighting the project. Well, Lucy, uh, my apologies that we have run out of time, but uh, we do appreciate you coming in here and updating us on, on what is uh, something that's changing almost daily here. So thanks for taking the time to be with us today. Thank you. And unfortunately, that is all the time we have for today. And a very big thank you to all our guests. Lucy there from Ottawa, Clayton, Thomas Mueller, Canahus Manuel, Stephen Buffalo, and Mike D'Souza. Uh, thanks to our producer, Charmaine. And join us again next week as we put another subject in focus. I'm Dennis Ward. Have a good rest of your day.